on. A um, few housekeeping uh, reminders to please mute yourselves during the presentation and use the chat box for questions. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Um, today we have with us, um, today we have with us Dr. Ryan McGinnis. He is an assistant professor in electrical and biomedical engineering here at UVM and serves as the director of biomedical engineering program and the MSense research group. Ryan earned his bachelor's degree from Lafayette College and his master's and doctorate from the University of Michigan before joining us here at UVM. Under his leadership, cross-disciplinary teams at, healthcare, at health tech startups and in academia have advanced biomedical technologies, leveraging data from wearable and mobile technologies to develop and validate novel digital biomarkers, phenotypes, and therapeutics. Currently, Dr. McGinnis's research efforts are focused on developing new digital therapeutics for improving the mobility and functional independence of individuals with multiple sclerosis, for optimizing orthopedic rehabilitation outcomes, and for addressing mental health problems in children and young adults. His work has been commercialized by several companies, and he is currently a scientific advisor for multiple health technology companies. Dr. McGinnis is a co-founder of Allostatic, a startup focused on developing digital health solutions for improving mental health. He is here today to introduce the UVM Center for Biomedical Innovation and to discuss the development of novel technologies for remote healthcare delivery. Please welcome Dr. Ryan McGinnis. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you can see this? All set. Awesome, excellent, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, I'm gonna be talking and introducing our new UVM Center for Biomedical Innovation and talking a little bit about how we're using that center to develop technologies for remote healthcare delivery. Uh, but first, a quick intro. Um, this is me. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in electrical and biomedical engineering, director of the BME program. Um, I run a translational research program here at UVM where um, we develop, as was mentioned, digital biomarkers, phenotypes, and therapeutics. Uh, the idea with these um, sort of buzzwords is um, really all the same. It's, it's the idea of taking data from wearable sensors like your Fitbit or your Apple Watch or your mobile phone and trying to translate those into objective measures of health um, and then occasionally trying to close the loop on those measures and try to um, deliver interventions via those technologies to improve health. Um, as part of our translational agenda, we, um, we, every project that we start has the goal of getting out of the lab and ultimately um, you know, trying to get to the marketplace and actually improve health outcomes for patients. And so um, the slides that I'm gonna present today uh, sort of come from um, each of these organizations that I'm somehow affiliated with and I've, I've left the format on them. So you'll see some format changes in the slides just so you have a sense of where they're coming from. Um, and I'm gonna start by talking about our um, biomedical engineering program at UVM. So you may or may not know, biomedical engineering is a, is a new program at UVM. It was started in 2016. Um, and it's the newest program in our College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Um, we received accreditation in 2020, um, and we have about 150 undergraduate students enrolled in the program now, which makes it the second largest engineering major on campus. Um, our students uh, take core technical classes in their first two years that give them training in biomedical engineering. Um, and then in their second two years, they um, really get to spread across campus and choose electives and courses to take that uh, helps them personalize their degree for their long-term career outcomes. Um, and we pair those technical classes with uh, vertically integrated four-year design sequence. So the hope is that our students are leaving with uh, training in both sort of the, the technical aspects of biomedical engineering, but also getting some real, uh, real world experience in designing medical technologies um, that they can then you know, bring to bear in their first positions when they graduate. Um, and what enables this cool four-year design sequence is our new Center for Biomedical Innovation. Um, and so you can see the, the mission and sort of vision of the center here, but really the key goal of this center is to improve rural healthcare delivery and to do that by leveraging the expertise that we have on campus in both um, uh, medical technology development, um, the clinical expertise of our, of our colleagues in the College of Medicine, um, nursing and health sciences, and then also the uh, commercialization and entrepreneurship expertise in the Grossman School of Business. 
Um, and what both our BME program and the new Center for Biomedical Innovation leverage is, is really sort of a unique situation that we find ourselves in here at UVM, which is that um, we're one of the few places in the country where we have a college of engineering and a college of medicine that are within walking distance from each other on the same campus. Um, and occasionally we like to speak to each other. Um, and I think what's also really nice, and especially for the Center for Biomedical Innovation, is that we have this College of Nursing and Health Sciences and our College of Business, you know, in between the two. And so we're really in a, in a unique position to um, build technologies that, um, and because of our location in Vermont, um, that can really be impactful on improving healthcare for um, those that live in rural environments, especially. Um, our center has some great space. Um, here's an image that shows what the, um, one of the design spaces in our Center for Biomedical Innovation looks like. This is a, a reconfigurable, um, you know, completely adaptable room that can serve for team collaboration. It can serve as a maker space. It can serve as a place where you hold customer focus groups, where you do needs finding exercises with, um, with clinical stakeholders. Um, so it's really exactly the space that you need to do this type of um, you know, medical, biomedical technology development. Um, and the next couple slides that I have are really meant to share some outcomes from the program so far. Um, so we haven't been around very long, but I think we have had, you know, we're starting to have an impact, um, both in terms of uh, allowing or, or helping fostering projects that um, are in this area, uh, but also in, um, in actually improving, you know, the patient experience for, for folks as well. Um, and so the first uh, project that I wanted to highlight was the Vermontilator. So you all have probably heard of the Vermontilator. Um, it was a project that was spearheaded by Jason Bates, who's in the College of Medicine and also um, you know, helps out with the BME program and is the director of our graduate programs. Um, and they created a new ventilator to help with the COVID pandemic. And it's an inexpensive ventilator. It's designed specifically for the pathomechanics that are associated with COVID. Um, and they're working now um, to, to receive FDA approval for use of that device. The other example to sort of target also comes from COVID. Uh, looks like we have a question in the chat. Okay, cool. Not directed to me. <laughs> um, so we also, uh, uh, another outcome from the CBI that came from the COVID time period is Panic Mechanic. And Panic Mechanic is a mobile application um, that we developed to help folks manage panic attacks, um, you know, where they're actually ha having them. And so the next couple slides uh, touch more on panic, panic mechanics. So um, as many of you probably know, a panic attack starts by some sort of emotional activation that leads to hyperventilation, uncomfortable symptoms because your hyperventilation changes your blood pH. Uh, this makes you feel out of control of your body. It's a negative feedback loop that leads to more hyperventilation, more uncomfortable symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if left untreated, panic attacks uh, have long-term negative health outcomes. It leads to additional comorbid psychopathology, um, suicidal thoughts, substance misuse, doctor visits, et cetera. And it's a big problem. Uh, 27 and a half million Americans have recurring panic attacks, um, but only 16% of them seek treatment. And the, the, we did some customer discovery interviewing of people that, that suffer from panic attacks. And we read the literature and we found that the reason that people don't get treatment for panic attacks is sort of twofold. One is that it's really hard to access mental health care providers. Um, and oftentimes the wait lists are, are long and, and that can prevent people from signing up. Um, and the other is, is sort of specific to panic attacks, which is that they're fundamentally episodic. Um, and so it's very hard to um, get treatment for a panic attack when you're actually having the attack. Um, and so the second problem is what we tried to, I guess really both problems, is what we tried to address with Panic Mechanic. And so the, the app sort of works this way. And, and this is available on the App Store and the Google Play Store. You can look it up. Um, but Panic Attack, your, your Panic Attack starts, you open the app. And the first thing you do is you take a measurement of your heart rate. Um, and I have a slide to talk about this in a second, but we developed some cool algorithms that let you estimate heart rate based on placing your finger against the camera on your smartphone. Um, you then rate uh, you take a subjective rating of your anxiety levels, um, and then you answer some questions about the um, potential trigger for your attack and some lifestyle factors that may uh, increase or decrease your risk of having panic attacks. And you do this repeatedly throughout your panic attack, continuing to take your heart rate measurements um, and you're rating your anxiety and, and answering these questions. And ultimately, at the end of your attack, you have a history um, or you can look back and see exactly how your body responded to your panic attack, but also you can look through your history of, of previous attacks to better understand how your panic attacks are changing over time. 
Um, so one of the key pieces of this product was developing um, this method for estimating heart rate using video from your smartphone. Um, and if you look back in the literature, there's um, lots of methods that have been presented and validated for doing that in, in controlled experimental conditions. You know, and they show just like we did that, um, you know, the heart rates that you estimate from your phone match really closely to heart rates estimated from ECG um, or sort of um, clinical grade PPG sensors. Um, the problem is that when you try to apply those algorithms to data that's collected by people in their everyday lives, um, you know, the results are, are pretty garbage, to be, to be perfectly frank. Uh, and so we uh, had to create our own method for doing this that helps us identify when um, we have high or low quality data and to improve that data to allow us to get a robust measure of heart rate. And so we developed this algorithm. We validated it in a large sample of patients, both with and without, who both have and who do not have panic attacks, um, and showed that the algorithm was accurate, but also that um, we were able to resolve the difference or the expected difference between people having a panic attack and people who, who are not having a panic attack when they're just resting. And you do see those elevated heart rates during panic attacks. Um, and now I have a video to actually show the app functioning, which I think is kind of cool for you to see. And uh, I'll just play it here. Um, there's no sound, so you'll have to bear with me talking you through it, unfortunately. Um, but you can see the person will eventually click on the panic mechanic app icon. And the app opens up. Tap to begin, and they place their finger on the camera. And this counter just counts up until enough data has been collected to accurately estimate the heart rate. And now they'll rank their or rate their anxiety level. Starts a little slow. <laughs> and they'll identify what they think was the trigger of their attack. They'll take another heart rate reading. And here they're rating their anxiety again. Now they're answering a question about um, lifestyle factors that may increase or decrease their likelihood of having an attack. And once you've tracked a few attacks on the app, um, we'll be able to predict how long your panic attack will likely last. Go ahead and pause this now. So I think the you can imagine there's you know some powerful things you can do with this, right? Like people as a user, you can look back on your panic attack data, understand, you know, over time what are your triggers to panic attacks, and that can point towards you know potential issues to address with a therapist. Um, it also lets you look at lifestyle factors that may be impacting panic attacks. For example, you can see that every time you um, you know eat poorly, maybe you have more panic attacks or um, going to the gym seems to reduce your likelihood of panic attacks. Um, and I think these are all important quantitative information that people can take, that our users can take into, into account in, um, uh, in using this app to manage their panic attacks. Okay. Uh, and so our users think so too. Here's some example feedback. Um, you know, one user notes that some, uh, the app gave them some measure of control over a very uncontrollable experience. Um, another noted that it really works. Um, and another felt like it was um, uh, helping them to uh, reduce the fear that they had for having future panic attacks. And I think that's a really important point to think about. This gives someone a tool to turn to, um, you know, for addressing a problem that before they, you know, they felt like was unaddressable and they weren't able to do anything about. And so I think it, it's really powerful. Um, and we have some, uh, a clinical evaluation of this app with some more objective measures that's ongoing. Um, it was sort of put on pause because of COVID, but, um, you know, hopefully we'll have some more data to report about the efficacy of this app going forward. Okay, so that's two examples of outcomes from the CBI so far. Um, here are two more, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of them in a second, but I think the first is, um, you know, arguably the most impactful outcome from the CBI is the students that we, um, you know, that we graduate. And so uh, here's an example of one student. This is Haley Warren. She graduated last year. Um, she's a NSF graduate research fellow now and is uh, pursuing a PhD degree at UCLA. Um, her research was focused on wearable robotics and particularly developing exoskeletons for helping people with balance and mobility issues. Um, and another example of a CBI project is um, just-in-time fall prevention. And so um, just-in-time fall prevention is meant to address this 
really significant need, which is that um, you know fall, falls are a huge problem. Uh, Twenty to thirty percent of seniors fall every year. Um, they cause injury, hospitalization. It's a huge, um, uh, a huge impact has a huge impact on quality of life for patients, and also a huge financial burden on the healthcare system. Um, and so, you know, there's a definite need to develop new tools that prevent falls uh, in people with balance and mobility deficits. And I think um, older adults are one area. Another area to consider is um, people with disorders like multiple sclerosis, where the fall rates are more like um, are more like 50%. So one in two people with MS fall every year. Um, and so we proposed to the NIH, based on some preliminary data that was done in the CBI, to develop a system called just-in-time fall prevention. Uh, and so the system works largely like this. You have some um, wearable sensors that are providing uh, measurement of how someone's body is moving throughout the day. Um, those data from those sensors are informing objective measures of fall risk. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but uh, if you have an objective measure of fall risk, you could you know, see how fall risk changes throughout the day. And the idea being that um, falls happen when fall risk is high and you don't have an intervention to prevent the fall. Um, and so the hope with the system is that if you have a continuous measure of fall risk, you can then intervene whenever fall risk gets too high to reduce the risk. Um, and the intervention we're, de we're deploying here is based on behavior change theory um, and, and sort of nudge, nudging patients to change the way that they're moving to help reduce their risk. Um, and there's two ways that we're approaching developing fall risk models. The first is by deploying um, traditional functional assessments. Neither, these are things that are used often in, in clinical assessment, um, you know, even now where patients perform activities like um, a timed up and go, for example, or um, a chair stand test, where the outcomes are things like the time to complete or the number of reps that someone does. Um, so we'll talk more about that in a second. And then also um, passive monitoring of, of participants to um, uh, understand how they're engaging in their daily activities to potentially get a real-time measure of fall risk. Okay, so as we talk through these two methods for identifying fall risk, um, just cycling back a little bit on people with MS, um, you know, 50% of people with MS fall. And one of the potential reasons for this is that um, MS symptoms fluctuate. Uh, and they fluctuate pretty dramatically, um, you know, certainly from one day to the next and um, even from one hour to the next within a given day. But the way that fall risk is assessed in this population is, is static. You do, you know, potentially one fall risk assessment during a standard clinical visit every six to 12 months. Um, and even when that fall risk is assessed, fall interventions are, are normally reactive rather than proactive. So, um, you know, an intervention isn't prescribed until after a fall occurs. And so it, you know, in this population, we certainly need to do methods for monitoring fall risk um, so that we can inform, you know, preventative interventions. Um, and so as we talk through these two methods for identifying fall risk in this population, we referencing a data set we've collected over the last couple of years um, that's longitudinal. So we have data from 40 people with MS, 20 fallers, 20 non-fallers. Um, we've collected 48 hours of accelerometer data um, plus some in-lab measurements at three time points, a baseline time point, a six-month follow-up, and a 12-month follow-up. Um, and just, I guess, as a, a point of reference, these sensors that we we're using to collect these data, um, these are pretty small. They're about the same size as a, a business card. And we deploy them to the patient's chest and their thigh. Um, and then these data inform our objective measures of fall risk. Um, okay, so quantifying functional assessments. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, um, functional assessments are used clinically now, and there's some, um, there's lots of assessments that are used, uh, things like the timed up and go and the time 25 foot walk. Um, one category of functional assessments involves characterizing um, someone's ability to transition from sitting to standing and standing to sitting. Um, and so you can deploy wearable sensors in all of these sort of functional assessments to um, get a better sense for how people are engaging in these assessments, um, not just um, sort of how many reps they do. And so here's an example of how we're doing that for a, a chair stand test. Um, and so the wearable sensor data, which is what you see in this top plot A, um, can be filtered down and used to identify different phases in the task. So you can identify when people are sitting, transitioning from sitting to standing, when they're transitioning from standing to sitting, and even sub phases within those. 
um, within those tasks. And then you can even zoom in a little bit further and understand specifically the biomechanics of how they're engaging in each of those phases. Um, so that gives you a really complete picture of how people are performing the tasks, um, but also allows you to do things like count the number of reps they perform, which is the sort of traditional outcome. Um, and I think it's important to, to note too that these data are interpretable. So um, here's an example of, of a, a 30 second chair stand test that one of our MS participants um, completed uh, during a free living monitoring period. And so you can see that they complete two of the um, transitions, two to stand reps, uh, but then they seem to have some sort of difficulty initiating stand from a seated posture. And so they wait a little bit and then they get, begin again in the task, do some more sit to stand transitions. And then they have, appear to have difficulty achieving a full stand here towards the end and they terminate their test early um, and just sort of wait the remaining, the last 10 seconds without doing any additional transitions. Um, and so these data, I think hopefully this shows that these data that we collect um, can provide really um, uh, complete information about what the participants are doing without having anybody there to actually view it happening. Um, and I think you all probably can see the power in that. Okay, so free living performance. Um, as I mentioned before, these participants completed these functional assessments at home, but then we also had them, or sorry, in, in the supervised setting in the clinic. Um, but then we also had them perform those same assessments at home. And in the case of the 30 second chair stand test, we had, we had them do it every two hours. So um, we have lots of uh, measurements that um, uh, we can compare to the supervised setting. And so um, the first one here is the supervised trial the patient completed. And you can see sort of regular transitions from sitting to standing. Um, here we have an unsupervised trial that looks very much like the supervised trial. Um, so again, regular transitions from sitting to standing. Um, at, in the free living condition, we also had people rate their fatigue and balance confidence. And you can see this person felt no fatigue and they felt um, they were, had very high, very confident in their balance ability um, at the time of this test. And then this is from the same participant later in that day, or um, I guess it was later, later the next day. Um, but you can see a drastic change in performance in this task, right? So this person go, went from very regular sit to stand transitions to um, completely irregular sit to stand transitions with experiencing instability potentially, certainly having a hard time either sitting or standing. Um, and so you can see um, the ability of these approaches for characterizing performance in these tasks um, in that unsupervised uh, setting. I think importantly here, um, the person who completed this task rated their fatigue and their balance confidence both the same as they did before. And so while they may not have had perceived fatigue or balance confidence, their performance in the task certainly had changed. Um, and so analysis of our full data set, um, these data from our full data set sort of leads us to a couple of conclusions. One is that the unsupervised performance um, of these tasks differs substantially from the supervised performance. And you see that in this example. Another is that the unsupervised performance varies significantly throughout the day. And again, you see that here. Um, and this is consistent across many of our subjects. Um, one thing that's interesting is that the fluctuations in performance are patient specific. So, um, you know, they're not tied to time of day. Um, there's no relationship from one patient to another where you see fluctuations, um, which I think maps onto the symptom fluctuations that you expect in people with MS, which you expect to be patient specific. Um, and I think importantly, unsupervised um, activities were better discriminants or better at discriminating fallers from non-fallers than the supervised assessments were. Um, so this implies that measuring uh, data at home may actually provide more sensitive assessments than, um, than what we do in the clinic. Um, and also measures of how the patients were completing the tasks were more uh, sensitive or, more, or better, discriminator, better discriminating, or better at discriminating between fallers and non-fallers than um, the traditional outcome measure, which is the number of reps. Um, so that implies that, you know, it could be advantageous to include um, simple measurement technologies to assess these tests at home so that we can um, get a more sensitive measure of potential fall risk for patients. Okay, so um, we touched on one approach for potentially characterizing fall risk at home, which is deploying those um, sort of traditional clinical assessments just in a home environment or in a free living environment. The other way that you could address this problem is to, um, to do passive monitoring. 
Um, and it leverages the fact that uh, in, in your everyday life, you're performing all kinds of balanced challenging activities that are exactly what's being tested in those functional assessments, right? Like you're transitioning from sitting to standing, you're transitioning from standing to sitting, you're walking, um, you're going upstairs. Uh, all of those things are needed to, to engage in your daily life um, and they're all balance challenging. And so theoretically you could leverage those just, just like you would a, a functional assessment to assess fall risk. Um, and this diagram sort of indicates how you might do that. So here we have data from a chest accelerometer, a thigh accelerometer, um, over the 48 hour wear period that people wore devices during this study. Um, the gray bars down here are the walking bouts. So these are every time somebody walked, we identify that using uh, the machine learning algorithm for detecting walking. Um, once you identify the walking bouts, you can go in and um, extract, you know, sort of perform standard gait analysis on those data. So we extract stance and swing phases of the gait cycle, identify gait cycles, um, and can even zoom in and look at gait biomechanics during those gait cycles. And this is again from every walking bout completed over the 48 hour period that people wore sensors. Um, so once you have those gate data, and again, gate is a balanced challenging task, you could um, you know, uh, try lots of different approaches for characterizing fall risk from those data. One method that we tried was to develop a, um, a classification model that um, tried to identify if the gate was from somebody that was a faller or a non-faller. Right? And so you can think of this as um, categorizing people into either high risk for falls or low risk for falls. Um, this model took four strides, um, so four gait cycles as input. Um, and it goes through, this is a, a deep learning model, so it goes through a, um, a bi-directional long short-term memory network and then a, a couple of other layers to ultimately yield the classification. Um, this is an ROC curve for those that aren't familiar. Um, the uh, perfect classification would occur if the either the blue or the red line were um, a right angle that went through this point right here, the zero one point. Um, and so you can see that um, based on this ROC curve, the um, the the classification model is able to accurately discriminate fallers from non-fallers using only four strides of data. And if you aggregate those four stride bouts over one minute of time, um, you can even improve that classification accuracy further. And that's pretty, um, that's pretty compelling to think about, right? So given only an observation of four strides, so you're talking something on the order of, you know, four or five seconds worth of data, we're able to discriminate fallers from non-fallers. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful and you can do that completely passively um, at home. All people have to do is put sensors on. Um, and so you might wonder how that compares to, um, you know, how you might traditionally do fall risk assessments. So, um, you know, asking patients to complete, um, you know, patient reported measures that are related to fall risk, things like the activity specific balance confidence scale. Um, and that comparison is shown in this plot here. So the, the blue ROC curve is our, the output from our model. Um, the performance of the, of the model. The yellow is the performance of a model trained on a variety of surveys that have previously been linked to fall risk in people with MS. And so you can see that the blue model outperforms the surveys. Um, the purple is um, the expanded disability status scale, which is a, a common measure of disability status in people with MS that has a skew towards walking disability. Um, this is a neurologist, neurologist administered scale. And you can see that the blue model also performs that. And even if you pair up the surveys and the EDSS together, um, the blue model still outperforms. And so um, using just four strides of data, uh, you know, you're outperforming sort of traditional methods for assessing fall risk. Um, similarly, uh, there are other ways to, to sort of slice the wearable sensor data. You could build models based on um, traditional spatial temporal gate parameters and that the performance of that model is shown in red. Um, you could also build models based on um, uh, sort of statistical features from the wearable sensor signals that's shown in, in yellow in this ROC plot over here. Um, again, the blue model, which is the deep learning based approach app performance, both of those. And this, this matches well with the literature in deep learning, which shows that for many tasks, um, you know, deep learning is the, is the superior approach when you're, when you're doing machine learning. Okay. So, um, this just-in-time fall prevention, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning of this project. We're exploring ways to 
leverage both remote deployment of functional assessments and passive monitoring for um, developing an objective measure of fall risk that you can tra track in real time and potentially use to um, intervene before falls occur. There's lots of work still to do here, um, but I think it's important just to note that all of this started with projects, um, you know, that our undergraduates were completing, uh, and it's helped to inform this, you know, NIH-funded work. So um, with that, I've given you a brief, a brief intro to our uh, Center for Biomedical Innovation, and I've given you some um, almost example case studies of how we've leveraged the resources at that center to develop technologies that can deliver um, healthcare remotely. And, you know, my hope going forward is that we can um, find partnerships, because I think there's a lot of overlap between what we do in our center and, and what you all are doing, um, and find ways to collaborate to really address the, you know, the healthcare problems that you all are passionate about. And, um, you know, I think we're in a good place to, to do that. So um, with that, a big thanks to our collaborators, our funders, uh, and most importantly, the students and, and, um, and staff who work in my group. So thank you, and I'll take your questions. Great. Thanks, Ryan. That was incredibly informative. Um, are there, I don't see any questions in the chat box. If uh, participants have questions, you can either um, pop them in there. I see someone's raised their hand. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, my name, I'm Chris Kaliba, and uh, I'm a professor in community development and applied economics, CDAE in CALS. And uh, I'm also directing the new Office of Engagement. So it's, it's really great to see and learn more about the, awesome. the center. Um, so I've got two questions. One is with my kind of social scientist hat on um, relative to the monitoring there. I was, I was sort of piqued by the, uh, by the person who rated themselves as confident, but, they're, but the data is showing that they, they're not. And yeah. I wonder if, if, you've been, if you and the team have been thinking about the educational opportunities or how to how to work with the clinicians on this um, so that the you know the self-awareness aspects of this tool and you know partnering with behaviorists that can check to, to see about how that the efficacious of you know the ability of this tool to educate them to actually monitor their 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 actions better going forward. And then my second question is more of a my office engagement had on, which is, you know, as you're developing these technologies, um, actively cultivating partners and contacts, um, you know, we can put together nice products and then hope for all comers to come. But, you know, is there, it seems to me that we, we can be doing some work to help with marketing these ideas, cultivating uh, constituents for this and being active in that space. So, so anyway, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah, of course. And, and thank you for your comments. I think the, especially the patient education one is really interesting. I mean, I, I think they're both really interesting. Um, you know, for patient education, I think, I think the system that we're developing actually, you know, may be really well suited for, um, you know, doing that as, as a piece, right? Because ultimately you're providing real-time feedback to the, to the patients. And so you're, you're um, just like your Fitbit tells you to stand up and like you should walk around when you've been sitting for a while. Um, you know, we're informing patients when they're at high fall risk to help them learn how to, um, you know, recognize it for themselves potentially. So I think that's a, that's a really great point. Um, the other piece, you know, I think, I think, yes, <laughs> we should, I would love to partner more on how we can um, sort of increase marketing for this. You know, all, all of these ideas don't come out of a vacuum. Um, you know, it's the, you know, the end of a needs finding process where we talk to stakeholders and talk to um, clinicians and talk to patients and really understand what what is and what is not working for them. Um, and so I, I think the more that we can do to to sort of build out that network and and communicate that better, the, the better off we'll all be in terms of adoption of these technologies going forward. So yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Ryan, along those same lines, um, just before we get to Moira's question, um, I I noticed in the in your introduction and in the beginning part of your um, talk, you it seems that the center or your own uh, personal research has a focus on child and young adult mental health, um, and the um, panic mechanic is sort of one piece of that. Um, I wonder. Um, um, how like sort of the mechanisms in place or if you would be interested in help developing 
connections with the community of pediatricians and pediatric uh, mental health providers within the state. Um, my own personal bent is that I am a pediatrician in the state. So <laughs> I'm very interested as we see sort of the um, sort of a national mental health crisis in children and adolescents during this oh. past year, which is like overwhelming our capacity to care for them. And I think that these, this mobile health technology would be so incredibly useful um, for our patient population. So I think I agree with Chris, like making these connections with the clinical community is so um, important. Yeah, and I 100% agree. I would I'd love to, um, you know, establish those collaborations, especially with pediatric mental health. It's such a passion area for me. Um, and we have a, a couple of really cool projects that are kicking off um, in the next couple of months around developing new ways to screen children for anxiety and depression. Um, objectively. So, um, you know, sort of helping to address the need that exists there, which is that, you know, ultimately kids aren't good at talking about their own mental health um, and, and parents aren't often that good at reporting it either. And so, um, you know, there's some need for, for better assessments in that area, but yeah, I would love to chat more. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from Moira in the chat box. Um, have you done any assessments of the effectiveness of false interventions um, with that technology? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't yet. We've sort of identified this as a potential outcome measure for that. Um, but yeah, you know, there there are some falls interventions out there that are oftentimes exercise based or um, sort of like you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this, like education based in terms of um, how do you organize your home to be to be less fall risky. Um, but yeah, I think I think that this is a great. It, it's another potential outcome of a technology like this. A, where you have an objective measure of fall risk. Hi, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Stephen Jershak. Very nice, to, nice talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm a primary care physician and a, a epidemiologist, and, and do some research on falls. And I think that this kind of system it just seems so important. Um, and uh, one area that I'm increasingly interested in is this idea of trying to look at changes or trajectories in physical function over time as a means to identify people who, you know, may not be, uh, you know, uh, falling, uh, you know, right, you know, that week, but are on sort of the path that way. So they can be timely interventions. And absolutely. Just, I'm wondering, um, have you, uh, have you partnered with any epidemiologists and sort of like the, those aging cohorts with fall outcomes to try to establish the like longitudinal change uh, metrics and then also uh, relate to fall outcomes? Yeah, we, we haven't yet. It's a great, um, I think you and I are thinking very similar on this though. I think the, the best way to address these problems is long-term monitoring where you can track trajectories over time and intervene, you know, as people approach, you know, being at, at high fall risk. Um, so I'd love to talk more about that. We are, we're trying to set up some projects with, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to monitor older adults in their homes. And um, we have a, this, this study that I mentioned, this NIH study, um, it's not the data that we present today, but we're, we are doing three months of continuous monitoring at home. So we're, we're definitely trending in that direction, but yeah, the longer term we can get, I think the better off we'll be. Thank you. It's a great point, thank you. Hi, Gary. Uh, I'm Gary Stein. I have a question that has to do, uh, really relates to uh, disparities and equities, and that is, uh, uh, the, the technologies are fantastic. The applications have tremendous, you know, uh, value now and tremendous potential. What about folks who do have limited internet access or the bandwidth isn't sufficient to be able to have those capabilities or the uh, or even the uh, the device to be able to go ahead and to you uh, to use that. And in Chittenden County, I mean that's probably you know minimally a concern, but once we start getting into other areas, in fact that does become you know a dominant uh, issue. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, I think I think uh, in the short term, internet connectivity and bandwidth is definitely a challenge, and we need to we need to find ways to address that. And so one of the one of the projects in the CBI that um, I didn't talk about today, but is is actually funny enough, a, a mobile health van <laughs> um, that will travel. The the idea, at least, is that it travels the state and it can provide services through the van, but also it would provide um, you know free internet connectivity for people that have these um, you know sort of mobile type interventions or mobile type health monitoring systems um, to allow that connectivity, even if it's only every week or every month. 
Um, so that's, I think that's one way we can address it. I also think in the long term, um, you know, ultimately, I think everybody's going to have internet access. It could be, um, ooh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so I just saw the, 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 the chat box about the mobile van. Um, anyway, uh, I think, you know, things like uh, satellite based internet and, um, you know, potentially drones for offering internet. I think there's lots of ways we can solve the internet connectivity problem that will be less of an issue a decade from now. Another potential um, resource and source to be able to provide access is that the health department has a state divided into 12 districts and the district offices can be a site where a person can actually go to and to be able to have capabilities they may not have you know, in their own homes. Oh, that's a great suggestion, thank you. And the person to speak to there is John Olson in the health department because he is committed to being able to work particularly in the rural regions of the state. That's fantastic, thanks so much. He'll be giving a talk actually in this series. Um, in fact, he'll be giving a talk partnering with his counterpart in Maine in, and in uh, New Hampshire to address some of these issues. Awesome, I'll have to tune in for that one, thank you. Other questions for Ryan? I wonder, Ryan, if you've um, thought about um, the potential applications of your technology. And again, I'm thinking specifically of the mobile health technologies that, that you've mentioned um, on an international basis in sort of low-income countries or very rural areas. Yeah, I think that's, you know, um, that's sort of the hope of a lot of these projects, right? Is that, you know, ultimately the same thing that works in your living room could work in living rooms across the world. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, even NIH, I think has identified this as an area, there's a, um, you know, a, a call for proposals that's around, um, you know, M health approaches for delivering healthcare in um, underserved countries. Um, I wonder so if you've connected with Barry Finette here at UVM. Um, he's, I have, have. yeah. I, I actually, I'm from I'm from Charlotte originally, so I played baseball with his uh, with his son Lucas. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's been quite successful um, with ThinkMD in doing that, so that's great. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, Ryan, I'm I'm just a uh, great talk. Um, Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, good to see you, man. I wish it was in person. Yep, likewise. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder if uh, have have you done any usability uh, studies of these? Like, how hard is it to actually, you know, because I when I when I send I've stopped I've stopped doing basically when I do like cardiac monitoring stuff I just do the Zio patch because it's like idiot proof you just yeah. pull the sticker off and put it on your chest and send it back two weeks later. Have you done any usability studies, um, even just informally about um, the the device? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. We haven't, um, we're a little bit too early in the process because we're still leveraging, a, um, at least for the fall intervention stuff, we're still leveraging a commercial system. But um, I think one proxy for that could be looking at adherence rates, right? And um, it's it's actually, I am I am shocked. We're, we're at about 98% adherence to the protocol and people have to put devices on and take them off every day for three months. Um, and they do uh, three or four functional assessments every day and they complete um, questionnaires ev every week. Uh, so in this study at 98% adherence, it, it implies that at least like they're willing to do these things for a relatively short period of time. Um, in terms of how that actually generalizes to every day in their free living settings when not on a research study, I, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a really good question, but I think the, the technology that you identified like Zio implies that um, there is a path forward there, right? Like there's a way to design these systems that um, people will actually use them and get useful data from them. It's a good question, thank you. Yes, Gary. I mean, another an, another application with uh, you know some some of these technologies is that right now when we look at um, cancer prevention, when we look at clinical trials, much of that really is uh, centered around uh, Chittenden County and access to uh, you know an academic you know um, cancer center and a medical center, but um, a lot of these technologies will allow a certain amount 
of um, these programs, both the education programs and the treatment programs, <clears throat> to be able to be available uh, in, uh, in rural areas, and even to be able to have some idea of uh, impending adverse effects and how to be able to go ahead and to deal with them. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Um, and there's a, there's a growing body of people who are really interested in that idea of decentralized clinical trials, you know, that don't rely on a site. Um, yes. So I think, yeah, I think especially that last piece around tracking trajectories during the trial to potentially prevent um, outcomes is really, or to prevent adverse events, I think it's really interesting to think about how you might do that. Because um, it could be, I think what's nice about technologies like this is that, um, you know, because you have an objective measurement where it's often replacing a subjective one, you can have smaller sample sizes. But um, I think if you could have smaller sample sizes and also prevent adverse events, that seems like a win all around. <laughs> Other questions or comments for Ryan? Great, well, thank you so much, Ryan. This was really interesting and I think a great introduction to your work and the work of your center for this uh, group. Awesome, yeah, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. We are appreciative, very thank much you. so. Thank you. Happy Friday. <laughs>